So, can, can you hear me? You've been set up. <laughs> yeah? You've got amazing pianists. Yeah, I started to learn piano during the um, uh, uh, lockdown. I'm not like that. You've got a saxophonist who plays amazing, amazing saxophone. And he looks like he's not trying. <laughs> Effortless. We have the head of psychology with two new, three new um, uh, uh, announcements. Yeah. We have the head of research. We had the head of uh, the um, uh, university here. Uh, you had Bibi uh, Ting uh, talking about being a warrior, and I've got something for you later on. And you had Sharon being a warrior. Yeah. Then you got me. Well, okay. But Sharon, one thing for you, a little bit of art. It's not my art. It's somebody else's art. You talked about bridging gaps. You uh, appear. You've gone from fighting yourself to creating a community of fighters. And I want to just recount the shortest poem in the world. The shortest poem in the world was actually written by Muhammad Ali. And it was written as a ch in response to a challenge from a whole group of academics at uh, Harvard that when he went to do a talk. And it is a very, very short poem, which I think encompasses what you're doing. And it is, me, we. Yeah. That's the only art you're gonna get from me. I'm an academic, <laughs> right? I'm an academic and what I do is I take academic research, we make academic research, and we try and change it into policy. And what we're going to do today, and what I'm going to do today, uh, is I'm going to give you a lot of information. So that's why I feel like I've been said, it's going to be a lot of information. But everything here you can have. The PowerPoint is yours, you can take it away. All of the information there, you can take away. Yeah. So that's what I am. Uh, I am in awe of what you're doing, uh, uh, Jude Mary. Uh, I'm in awe of what you're doing because uh, there are many of us in the past who've had research groups, yeah, research groups that have done some of this sort of work. But then to get the university to come with you, to work with community, to build, to get other people coming through and build new psychologists. We were talking about getting psychologists into, uh, you know, in, in other parts of the country, not able to get into psychology. That is the difference. And now, as we were yesterday talking uh, with ministers about trying to make a change, that is the difference. It's not enough to do, it's not enough just to talk. You have to change and moving from just doing, producing uh, research papers to actually making the changes, why I'm in awe of the work that you're doing. So I said, you're gonna get a lot of information and this information is gonna be in three parts. Let's see if it works for me. It does. So you're doing something wrong, mate. <laughs> Works perfectly for me. Um, this information is in three parts. I'm going to do, because we're a mixed group, I'm going to do about 20 minutes, something like that, talk about black mental health in Canada. Then I'm going to talk about some solutions and I'm going to talk about approaches. Uh, and then I'm going to give three case uh, histories over the last two years of how people have started making a change. And that's where some of, uh, there's going to be a little bit for sickle cell there, a little announcement for sickle cell. And then I'm going to be talking about a way forward. And you'll see that the way forward is about what we can do, not to do the research, not to uh, produce new clinical programs, but what we fundamentally have to do in Canada to get to the next level. And to get to the next level, we don't need piecemeal projects. We don't need project funding. We don't need short-term solutions. We need systemic change.
we need proper systemic change. And proper systemic change doesn't come from nice words or academic paper, it comes from changes in the law. So, black mental health. So, academic paper. Many years ago, Bree MJ, uh, 2005, uh, yeah, 2005. What happens? And the only reason I'm sending this up is because we're in a complex area. And what I want to just show is that we often start uh, by thinking about the pathway to getting ill. We're in balance in our lives. Things happen to us. We start getting distressed. Yeah. Some of us bounce back to balance. Some of us don't. We go from distress to having symptoms. Some of us bounce, bounce back. Some of us don't. Those symptoms start becoming worse. And then some of us bounce back. Some of us don't. Then they start interfering with our lives. It's when they start interfering with our lives that we start saying we've got to do something. We very rarely go to primary care or mental health at that time. We go to family, friends, communities. Yeah. Uh, these days, and sorry to pick on you, but you're young and I'm old. We go to TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> we go to social media. We go to loads of places to get information and to get help. That's where we go to. Yeah. If that doesn't help, then we say, we've got to go to see the family doctor or we've got to go to the hospital. Obviously, if things are really extreme, you can skip any stage. You can go from being in balance straight into the emergency department, but that's not usually what happens. And what we try and do along each stage is we try and get love, resource, and support that bounces us back up. That's what we're trying to do. And it's pretty stereotyped. But what a lot of us and what we all think is when we want to intervene on mental health, we have to think about primary care, family doctors, or we have to think about hospitals. Well, for every one person who ends up in, uh, in primary care, a hundred are suffering. For every one person who ends up in hospital, a thousand are suffering. We've got to think upstream about how we create support upstream, how we go from me to we. That's the sort of thing we have to think about. And we have to think about it because some of the things I'm gonna be talking about are not on that pathway from balance to being in a hospital. They're about the things that drive us one way or the other. They're the boxes on the side. They're about life events. They're about stress. They're about vulnerabilities. They're about anti-Black racism. That's what's pushing us down. And the things that are supposed to be pushing us up are community supports, our social safety net, building our resilience. They're supposed to be pushing us up. So when we think about Black mental health, it's easy to be thinking about Black mental health care, but I want to be thinking about what we do about the forces that are pushing us down and what we do about the forces that should be pushing us up. How we work those forces are really important. And the reason that they're really important are that mental health treatments work. Mental health treatments very rarely cure. They work, they make you better. Some people get cured, often people are left with some vulnerability. And so we want to stop people getting ill. Rather, we, yes, we do have to make it better and we have to have equitable services, but we need to stop people getting ill. And people uh, in the black communities in, in Canada are getting ill too much. So what do we know? We have high levels of life events and stress. What do we know? We know that the way social services and other services and policies are set up, uh, they undermine communities and they undermine communities' ability to be resilient. We know that, yeah. And then we know that the care we get when we need it is not good. It's not appropriate. It's not available. It doesn't deal with the fundamental issues we have to deal with. 
So those are our big three things we have to do. And we can't do one of them. If we really want to make things better, we have to do all three. Some information. This is a Canadian medical association, not really known for being left-wing, not really known for being non-biological. That's not what they're known for. But they've done this piece of work, which is trying to quantify what makes us sick. And if you look at it, 50% of what makes you sick and stops your recovery is your life. 25% is your access to healthcare. 15% is your environment, yeah? And only 15% is what people spend a lot of time talking about genetics and things like that. Genetics are important for sickle cell, but genetics are not the most important thing for mental health. The most important thing for mental health is 85%, which is the social factors, the social determinants of health. So in Canada, we've quantified it. In America, because it's America, they come up with some really lovely phrases. They call them aces, yeah? If you have a pair of aces, usually you win. If you have a pair of aces here, you lose, okay? Aces are adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environments. And you'll see if you look through the list, the black population in Canada, high levels of adverse childhood environments high levels of adverse um, uh, community environments, very clearly. We can go through the list, we can go through the data, we'll melt, maybe talk about a bit of it later, but it's very clear. And the importance of that is that the academic work, which has looked at ACEs, both in America and in Canada, has shown very clear associations between ACEs and the number of adult outcomes. Poor academic achievement, poor work performance, financial stress, intimate partner violence, risky behaviors, physical illness, mental illness, and substance use disorder, all linked to adverse community and adverse child environments. All things you can do something about with good policy. Yeah and all of which you can intervene on along the way. So it's not like you have a difficult childhood and you're doomed. You can always do something about it. So ACEs are not a prescription for being negative. It's not a prescription for deciding that nothing can change. It is a prescription for change. And you know that people talk about these sorts of social determinants that plague the black population in Canada. And usually people talk about them. And so I went and I actually looked up the literature to put figures on them. Racism, general population, 30% in the last year, significant racism that will, that will impact your health, uh, the black population, three times more likely to be in prison if you're black two times more likely to have children's aid involved in your family if you're black, um, 10 times more likely to be a victim of gun crime and gun murder in Canada if you're black compared to anybody else. And then there's education, poverty, and don't forget these things interact. So it's not like you're in one group and not the other, you're in many different groups. And when I talk about education, it's uh, people usually look about look at dropout rates and say that you're more likely to drop out from uh, uh, from school if you're a black man. People say you're less likely to get into university if you are uh, black in Canada, and those things are true. But there are other things underneath the service that are much more pernicious, things that really change your trajectory in life. This is from Statistics Canada. And it shows two groups of people, black population versus the rest of Canada. And it asks two questions. The first question is, would you want a degree? Would you like a degree? Black population, 94% of people would um, like a degree. 
they'd want a degree, they want a university degree. The rest of the population, about 80, 80%. It's not that that's a problem. It's the next column. Do you think you'll obtain a degree? And if you're black in Canada, 60%, 94% want a degree, 60% think they will be able to attain a degree. Whereas for the rest of the population, about 83, 82% of people want a degree, about 79% of people think they can do it. And so think of what that does to us. Think of what that does to the children. Think about what that does to the youth. That undermining belief that you want something, but your aspirations are likely to be thwarted. Think of what that might do to your mental health and think about how we might change that because it's those sorts of things we need to change if we want to change trajectory. This is a complex chart. So one of the things you're never supposed to say when you're doing a talk is this is a complex chart. Because if you put up a complex chart, it's you're doing your talk badly, right? So uh, maybe this isn't as complex as it seems. But what it shows is three things. We tried to calculate at the Wellesley Institute uh, how much money you need to thrive. Not how much money do you need just to survive. Not how much money do you need to put uh, food on the table not how much money do you need to have some sort of shelter, but to actually have the sort of shelter that is healthy, to have enough space, to have a good, uh, nutritious food, to be able to say that if I miss one or two paychecks, my life isn't going to fall to pieces. How much money do you need? And we've calculated that and you can see the papers on the Wellesley website. But the point here is the third columns. If you look at the third columns, that's the percentage of people for the black population, for um, the white population, and for others living in the greater Toronto area who have enough money to thrive. And only 26% of the black population in the greater Toronto area, the biggest population of black people in the country, only 26% have enough money to thrive, 26%. When you talk about the poverty rate, poverty rate in Canada is about seven or 8% at the moment. Poverty rate for black Canadians uh, runs at about, I think uh, 12, 13%. And people say poverty is on the way down. Poverty is on the way down. Thriving is not on the way up. Poverty and getting people out of poverty is not enough for a high income country. It's not enough for a country that sits at the G7 table. We've got to do better than that. We've got to have bigger aspirations and people just not being in poverty. And we're rich enough to do that. So these are the things that I'm thinking about because I do policy when I'm thinking about what we have to change. I spoke too soon, didn't I? I joked with you that it wasn't working, that it was just you, not me. That, uh... <sighs> now, when we put it all together, we talk about anti-black racism. You've heard the phrase anti-black racism. See, I put you to sleep. You've heard the term anti-black racism. Yeah, great. Good, because earlier on, uh, we were talking and Regine was saying, are we in church? And if we're in church, we can do call and response, yeah? Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, so you've heard the term anti-black racism, yeah. Where'd it come from? No, no one knows. Sorry? States? No, Canada. Ryerson University in Toronto, in Canada, they coined the phrase anti-black racism. That is a Canadian concept. America's picked it up. It's a Canadian concept. It is actually, whoop. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess it's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, would, wouldn't it be good if it was something positive? <laughs> uh, take what we can get. <laughs> okay, 
So anti-black racism is actually was actually coined to, to describe the Canadian experience of these multiple different levels of inequities all put together with, to make sure uh, that black people don't progress. But it actually went further than just saying that there are multiple inequities, all of these things that intersect. It said that it wasn't the inequities, it's the fact that people either don't know about them or don't care about them. It's the fact that there's no visibility to these compound inequities, which we feel every day, and that we don't do enough about it. So this is a Canadian idea. Yeah. Uh, loads of things, by the way, are popular are made elsewhere, and then the Americans say they're theirs, uh, like uh, the internet and computers and all of that. All of those not American, uh, um, or even the telephone, which was a Scots guy who was in Canada, by the way, uh, but it's an American uh, thing. One of the reasons when we talk about anti-black racism, I, it's a good ringtone. Uh, when we talk about anti-black racism, um, we uh, really think big. Uh, and a lot of the work doesn't talk about this big meta stuff. It talks about the uh, lived experience of uh, uh, racism. And uh, uh, Jude Marie was talking about the lived experience of racism. And I just wanted to remind you when people talk about racism stress, why it's so important. Racism stress is not the same as other stress. So if you or I go for a job and we don't get it, we get the same level of stress as anybody else. We didn't get the job, first level stress. You can tell how old this slide is, it's got animation. Stress because of a life event, no problem. Same level of stress as anybody else. Then you start thinking, was this because of discrimination? the stress rises. So the same event, you haven't got the job, but stress at two levels, not one level. And then if you can't do anything about it, your third level of stress. So for the same event, you get much more stress because of racism. Yeah. This three level model is really important because it's not just, oh, it's a bit stressful. It's a different type of stress. It's a more profound, pernicious stress. It's a stress that does all sorts of things to you. 500 papers looking at the impact of perceived racism and health outcomes, 500 papers. Now, just to let you know, smoking, bad for your health. Everyone knows that. Legislation on it, terrible for your health, yeah. Probably the things changed when they got to about 200 papers, okay. 500 papers, 500 papers, meta-analysis here by Pascoe and Richmond, looking at how racism, perceived racism leads to poorer health. Uh, heightened stress response, well, we know that, it's three-stage uh, stress response, but also some of the things people do to decrease that stress, taking drugs, smoking, drinking, that we talked about uh, earlier, all of those lead to worse health outcomes. So it's not just stress, it's also sometimes what we do to avert stress that leads to poorer mental and physical health. But those four or 500 papers also show social support, understanding that the problem is racism and developing coping strategies to deal with racism all decrease the impact of racism on health. And you have to decrease the impact of racism on health because it gets under the skin. So it's not that you just perceive it, it changes your biology. Stress changes your biology. It uh, causes increased stress reactivity, inflammation, uh, decreases your creation of new cells, new, so neurogenesis, uh, all shown. Uh, it uh, changes your, uh, um, your hormones and uh, some of these things that you need to protect you from uh, illness, your T cells are impacted. 
And this is important because one of the things your T cells do and your T killer cells is they're your surveillance mechanism. They go around your body looking for cells that aren't working properly and they eat them. If they're not working properly, you have a higher risk of cancer. So actually stress that impacts your killer T cells is a problem. Then of course, we've got early aging, weathering, and these intergenerational impacts of uh, stress, maternal stress and uh, fetal growth, all of which have been shown in uh, research. All of this is not my thinking. All of this is the compounded research over years. We know a lot. So that's that first thing of the things that are pushing us down. But what about the things that are pushing us up? This is much more difficult. One of the reasons why it's difficult is the type of racism we face there is not always in what people do. It's in what people don't do. So the question is, how come we have education strategies that don't work for us? How come we have poverty reduction strategies, housing strategies? How come one third of uh, black Canadians are food insecure and it's rising? Why haven't we got that? Tell you a, a story, a very simple story. Uh, you have all heard of the CERB, yes? Yeah, so the CERB was brought in and uh, it was supposed to give everybody at least $20,000 to get through the pandemic. After the CERB was brought in, we did a survey of 500 agencies saying, are there any problems with the CERB? And it was really clear that the main problem with the CERB is it wasn't reaching racialized communities. It was so badly organized you, you couldn't get through on the phone, say, for instance, you had a two hour wait on the phone and it wasn't a toll free number. You had to phone yourself and if you didn't have uh, credit, you couldn't get through. Yeah, there were too many forms. It was unclear. It wasn't in many different languages. The CERB was really difficult to get hold of uh, for some populations. We were lucky. At that time, we had Ahmed Hussein, who was a minister. So we could send him the research and say, you've got to reform this thing. Yeah. Do you remember one of the things about the CERB initially is if you were running two jobs and you lost one of them, you didn't get the CERB. Yeah. So you think of how many people have to run two jobs to keep, their, keep things alive, right? You couldn't get the CERB if you had two jobs. And just having that research but not just the research, as I said to, uh, was saying about Jude Marie, getting the research in front of the right people, showing that this was a problem. It, they just changed the policy. You could, you could get the CERB after two, even though you had two jobs, they changed it within a month. They started putting information for the CERB into community centers. So communities could get hold of, could uh, ask uh, and apply for the CERB for other people. And it changed and the equity of the CERB increased, didn't get back to actual equity, but increased. All of these things can be done and they need to be done. This is an analysis published by the Mental Health Commission of Canada, looking at spending, because we're in Ontario, looking at spending on mental health per head of population in, um, in uh, uh, Ontario. And uh, essentially, if you're a non-immigrant, more is spent per head of population on your population uh, than on uh, any other group. Actually, the African origin and Caribbean origin come next. But that is actually because um, hospital care for mental health problems and forensic care for mental health problems is very expensive and we're more likely to be in forensic care. Okay. Uh, if you take away the forensic care and you just look at community, then we're down to about 30 or 40% funding per head of population for mental health care for the black population compared to the white in Ontario. So it's not always what you do, it's what you don't do. 
It's whether you get the money to the right places. So, getting care. Poor access to care, we know that. Uh, uh, Jude Marie was talking about people feeling that uh, care was uh, discriminatory, uh, people not really understanding um, uh, the, our needs, um, but also more coercive care, more likely to be brought into hospital against the will, given medication when you don't like it, and less access to psychotherapy. That is a problem we have. So what I've done so far is talked about the drivers which are driving us down talk to us about the things that should be lifting us up, which are not as effective, and now talking about this middle section of the care pathways, which are dysfunctional, uh, and less access to psychotherapy. Barriers to care, language, fear, shame, service accessibility, what happens when you go and you find that you uh, don't get on with your physician or they don't understand you, and uh, then circumstantial issues like the time's not being right. So you, you have to take a day off work to go and see the therapist is not happening. Yeah. Or um, cost, transportation, things like that. It looks like a spaghetti diagram. Yeah. You're looking at it and you're thinking, what is going on there? Yeah. I don't really understand that diagram. Uh, this is 40 people with serious mental health problems that have just started, who want to get um, uh, early intervention. Yeah, and this is in Hamilton and in Toronto. And on average, they see four different services before they get early intervention. And this is a black population. The time between getting symptoms, hearing voices, being deluded, being paranoid, to getting early intervention, 16 months. Remember, usually youth. So don't think 16 months, think two academic years. Yeah, pushed back two academic years, trying to find your way through this maze. Yeah, going to the emergency department being sent to a family doctor, the family doctor sending you to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist sending you to the emergency department, the emergency department sending you to the acute hospital. Uh, you have a stay in a hospital and the most likely place you're going to be referred to early intervention, if you're black in Ontario, is from a hospital bed. It's not very early not very early. Uh, another problem, that's a, a Canadian mental, a medical, mental health, uh, sorry, Canadian Medical Association paper. Uh, this is the same thing in a different way. Um, all this is showing, and just look at the big, um, uh, uh, just looking at the big, um, uh, the big um, columns, uh, white European, 40% referral, uh, to early intervention services from hospital, black, African, uh, nearly 55%, uh, and black Caribbean, 65%. So problematic pathways to care. And there's a predictable outcome. This is from the um, Black Experience Project. And the Black Experience Project uh, was about 1,500 uh, people around the GTA and asked a whole bunch of questions. And you can see from that, that uh, the last, uh, who's got a lot of stress? Well, the green is the black population. They're more likely to have a lot of stress than any other population. And if you do the same thing for whether their mental health is good, again, green is the black population, uh, more likely to have bad mental health, less likely to have good mental health. And then if you look at uh, clinical diagnoses like psychosis, the Caribbean population, 60% more likely to have a psychosis. So, so far, I have created, I'm looking at people, people are shaking their heads, people are, they've been talked to for a while, it's a hot room, 
and I have given you no hope. Now, that could be because I'm a psychiatrist and I'm trying to make sure that I have work. But that would be cruel and against the Hippocratic Oath. There are solutions and one of the things uh, that is going to, I'm going to be saying over and over again, and you will know from being in this room, that there are lots of solutions. There are lots of people who are doing great things. There are lots of projects out there in black mental health that's making a difference. Uh, Jude Marie talked about the mental health of black Canadians project out of um, Public Health Agency of Canada that is funding lots of different things. I can't see anybody here from SAPASI, uh, but there is SAPASI, which is uh, just been given um, uh, $3 million a year, every year in perpetuity for black mental health in the community in, uh, in, um, the, in the whole of Ontario. Uh, I was hearing yesterday about some wonderful work, arts-based work that's going on in Nova Scotia. And we have other people from Nova Scotia here who've been battling forever. <laughs> to get things and make things better. There is lots out there. Uh, and the approach people are trying to use is a health equity approach. Yeah, where uh, we're not trying to change everything, but we're trying to change the things we can change. That's what health equity is about. Uh, but I wanna go further. How many people have seen this before? Everybody's seen this before, wonderful. So you know that, you know, when we're talking about equality, we're talking about everybody having the same supports. We know that doesn't help you see the game. We talk about equity and we talk about different supports for different people. That's nice. But the history is those supports disappear. Those supports crumble. Those supports change. People's needs change, but we don't change with them. So we need to move to justice. We need to get rid of the barriers, because unless we get rid of the barriers, we are going to always be trying to uh, make things a little bit better. And justice should be the aim of health equity. Because, as I said earlier, we have to focus on differential risk. We can't just do better services. Better service is great. We have to do better services while we're waiting for other things to change. It is a moral imperative to produce bigger, better capacity, more people who can offer equitable care, better interventions so that care ends up uh, equitable and better health systems so that people can get access to equitable care and equitable recovery. We have to do that. But if we only do that, what we're saying is we're happy that black populations are in Canada are at increased risk of illness and increased rates of illness. And the only way we can decrease the rates so that they're similar to other people is by changing our policies, by focusing on the specific social determinants of health and by dismantling anti-black racism. It is not sufficient just to change care. We have to change the environment. Is it me? There we go. And this is what I said before. This room and many rooms like this show that the foundations are there. We actually have innovative treatments, community care, community-based care models. Um, we have uh, some great research teams and some city policy policies. This is the old slides, not the new slides, I have noticed, but that's okay, we'll work with them. Um, but what we need to do is we need to build, we need to scale, and we need to spread. We need to do more. So now I'm gonna tell you three stories from just the last two years, just to illustrate how things can change. The first starts with 
2020, high rates of COVID-19, uh, George Floyd's death, the growth of a community group called the Black Health Equity Working Group uh, based in Toronto, but anybody could join, saying, we need to do something about this. And the first thing we needed to do was to get data. And so the Black Health Equity Working Group said, if we can get the data and work with community, we can identify whether there are COVID disparities for black populations and we can do something about it. And there was a very straightforward plan. Start off with the data that's available and demonstrate that there are differences. Then try and get the government to collect individual level data and use that as a lever, give that to the press, make sure that people can see there's a problem. Once there's a problem, try and help the government come to solutions uh, and work with community to produce those solutions. When the first data was done, it was clear that some parts of Toronto, especially the northwest of Toronto, had rates of COVID which were 10 times the rates of, other, of uh, other parts of Toronto, 10 times, yeah. And the percentage of racialized people in an area was your best predictor of, uh, of uh, the COVID rate in an area. This led to consternation. Middlesex and London started collecting race-based data. Peel started collecting race-based data. Then Toronto started collecting race-based data. So these public health units started collecting race-based data. That produced momentum and momentum uh, through community pressure and media pressure to the point where the Ontario government changed its laws and its policies to start collecting race-based data. Then you're in business. Because once you've got the data, you can start showing the disparities properly and you can show them widening or shrinking. And by uh, August, when the first lot of data had been, um, uh, had been properly analyzed in Toronto, there were such great disparities that Toronto Public Health said, let's go to the community and see what we can do to change this. Let's see how we can decrease these disparities. And half of the things that came up from the community were things that were focused on the pandemic. There were community public health campaigns, testing and pop-up sites, masks, sanitizer, free voluntary, voluntary isolation sites. But half of the things that they got Toronto to do were not to do with the pandemic, they were to do with the social determinants of the pandemic. And that's eviction protection, that's food security, yeah. that is uh, emergency childcare, digital access and culturally appropriate uh, multilingual counselling. So that's what Toronto started doing. And this was the result. So what you need to see is the second line down is the black population. In June 2020, the rate of COVID was six times the rate of the white population. By August, it was nine times the rate of the white population. And when the community focused pandemic response came into being, which was August, September, the rates came down and down and down. And by December, the rate was still inequitable, but instead of being six or nine times higher, it was twice as high. The manage to decrease inequities in COVID, the number of people being infected, the number of people being in ICU, the number of people who ended up, uh, who ended up dying by community-focused data action. Yeah. It can be done. We published this in The Lancet. It can be done. And it was done. But one of the things we learned from this is uh, the difference between feasibility and viability. So if you've got a problem and you get a solution, you and you've got a solution, there are two ways of getting there. One way is to prove that you can change it. You can get there. That's feasibility. So we set up a project, we managed to get there. Fabulous feasibility. Uh, 
feasibility studies are interesting but for every project and they say that Canada is the land of pilot projects projects come projects go we demonstrate things are feasible and then we let them go so the work you have to do is on viability not can you do it not just can you do it can you keep it done yeah can you keep it done what do you need to do to keep it done and we that was one of the most important lessons from this not that we can decrease rates we were able to do that we knew that community-based work would decrease rates if it was instigated properly but the question is can you keep it done and this is some of the work that is ending up helping other uh, uh, groups and so the black physicians association of ontario the uh, black health alliance uh, wellesley institute where i am and also ontario health have worked together to produce a black health plan for ontario this black health plan is part of ontario health's strategic plan and i i can't tell you directly <laughs> but one of the things that we have been pushing for in the black health plan is specific focused money for sickle cell specific focused money in uh, all of the ohts through ontario health just for sickle cell with metrics attached for what we want to do and so that's one of the things that we're doing under the black health plan because the black health plan does three things it tries to produce an equitable pandemic uh, it tries to produce an equitable health system and social recovery but third it works on those sustained health equity for black populations data collection changing things like sickle cell changing things like uh, cancer screening changing the metrics that are used to measure the health system all of these are the sorts of things including anti-black racism training uh, that are part of the uh, black health plan uh, which is a provincial plan now i'm going to move up over to the beasts i work with i work in um uh, i work in um wellesley institute but i also work at camh and CAMH is a very proud institution as being one of the biggest mental health and academic sciences um, institutions in Canada. Uh, and CAMH has 44% higher rates of restraint for black patients compared to any other patients, hasn't got pay equity for its black staff, uh, does not have good transition through the organization for its black staff so that they come become leaders and when staff experience racism from other staff or from clients it hasn't got good models of how to deal with that and what to do to to look after client health it doesn't have all of that stuff and it doesn't have equitable access to psychotherapy yeah but what it does have now is an anti a plan to dismantle anti-black racism a structured plan 22 actions by the end of uh, this financial year to try and move things forward but a living document which says after that we do more and uh it wasn't just created by camh it was created by camh and partners in the community a proper community-based dismantling anti-black racism in a major teaching hospital uh, in Canada that doesn't just try to improve patient care but it tries to imp improve care for patients and families it tries to improve what's happening for the staff and then it challenges CAMH to use its voice to make the system better yeah so a challenging um, uh, strategy which is actually part of CAMH's strategic plan and is a main part of its strategic plan and so things can change um, things can change it is possible to change uh, 
things, it's possible to develop systems of care that come for the families. It is possible to enhance services. But one of the things that I am really proud of, and one of the reasons I'm proud of it, is because I am not doing it, is our clinical care committee has taken up going through every one of CAMH's clinical, uh, clinical um, policies to make sure that they're anti-racist. Everyone. Yeah. They all over a two year period come for review. And in the clinical care committee review, they've all been trained um, uh, health equity impact assessment, race equality impact assessment and anti-racism. And they go through the policies to say, no, that's not, we've got to change this. Yeah, that doesn't work. How do we change this? What do we need to do? What education do we need to improve this? And I'm not doing it. Ah, it's lovely. Uh, the system has taken it up. And that is the change that I'm really interested in, that the system is taking it up. It's not the small health equity for a group, which is 15 people in a three and a half thousand person organization that's trying to do this. It's across the organization. Uh, and uh, it's also trying to change the way we think about things. So the Horizontal Violence Committee, which is producing policy on horizontal violence, is an equitable committee that anybody who's black and racialized, in fact, anybody can join. Yeah. And uh, their, their clinical leaders have to give them time off to do this. So it is a proper sort of CAMH community attempt to try to deal with horizontal violence. Uh, and getting our researchers on board so that the, the research plans uh, are better um, with regards to what the needs of black populations are one of the things that I'm really proud of as well. I've got all of the actions here uh, for completeness for people who have the slide, uh, slides, but um, I just wanted to go on before coming towards an end uh, to talk about uh, this. Has anybody seen what the city of Toronto have been doing. Was that a yes? No, no, no. no. Uh, speak with one voice, yes or no? Okay, some have, some haven't. The wonderful thing about this is we talk about mental health being everyone's business. We talk about it, uh, but a lot of people don't really think it is their business. The city of Toronto itself doesn't offer mental health services. It does pay for some counseling services. It does uh, pay for an alternative to police involvement. Uh, it set that up and it's been running now for about a year uh, so that uh, crisis involvement has been taken away from the, from the police um, and is now in a city run program, which is run mainly by black organizations. To, so, that, so it does do that sort of thing but it doesn't offer mental illness services. But it has started Black Mental Health Day. And I, I'm just gonna give my voice a rest while I just go through these three slides because you can read them. Can everybody read them? Sure. Thanks. I was going to take it off, but then I realized I've got a lapel mic on, haven't I? Yes, please. Oh, where is it? Yes, please. Thank you. Why this is important to me, and one of the reasons all of these three things we've been doing over the last two years are important, and I know there are people out there who've done similar things. I know that there is action all across, the, uh, across Canada. I know it's sort of easier to do these sorts of things in Toronto and in Ontario, and that there are other places in the country where it's much more difficult uh, to get things done because there are fewer uh, black uh, smaller black population with fewer 
black um, uh, professionals. And I realize uh, people talk about privilege, but even inside black populations, there are people in more privileged positions than others. And I'm in a privileged, privileged position uh, being in Toronto though actually I feel I should be in a, I should be coming to Ottawa because it looks like there's a there's a, there's a, a bit of a privileged position in the University of Ottawa that looks a bit better than the University of Toronto though we have some great people at the University of Toronto but the reason why I'm interested in these things is they started thinking long term they started thinking about anti-black racism they started thinking about how you can lever some of the innovations to actually cause sustained long-term uh, change. And that is important. And this is the last bit, last few slides. This is the Broad Street Pump. The Broad, you're, you're smiling, you're an epidemiologist. No, <laughs> you're an epidemiologist. Sorry, you're a student, right. So, you know, this is a Broad Street Pump. The Broad Street Pump, and it's the John Snow is the pub behind it. And John Snow, uh, was a person in the uh, 1800s who managed to demonstrate that a cholera epidemic in the UK, well, actually in London, was linked to the water that was coming out of this pump. And being a public health vandal, he went and he took the um, uh, handle off the pump and managed to get rid of the epidemic. And that was important at the time because the big disparities in health between rich and poor at that time were due to infections. Now, after John Smith did his work, there were various other people who started saying, well, what is it in the water? And we got the germ theory revolution. We discovered bugs. And from bugs, we discovered sanitation. We needed to do sanitation. We needed to, we got uh, antibiotics. We got immunizations. We got all of these things to kill bugs and the differences between rich and poor did not change. Instead, they went through to infections. It was now hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, chronic illness, yeah. And that's because there's this theory that comes from it. The theory of fundamental social causes, see it, uh, link and feeling uh, in, um, at, out at um, uh, uh, Columbia University. And they say, well, just a second, money, power, access to information. These are the fundamental causes that cause health disparities. And unless you target those, health disparities will just come back in a different way. And so they say there are fundamental causes, then there are mechanisms. And some of those mechanisms uh, would be infectious diseases, some would be chronic diseases, uh, some of it would be substance misuse, some of it would be mental health problems, but those are the mechanisms by which your fundamental causes cause your health disparities. And racism and anti-Black racism are fundamental causes. You have to work on the mechanisms. It's really important. You have to work on the fundamental cause because if you don't work on the fundamental cause, the disparities just come back in a different way. Fundamental causes are smart. You know, people talk about smartphones. This is the smart cause. Many social determinants are mechanisms, not causes. You have to look at the causes if you want to make fundamental, long-lasting change. If you want to go from feasibility to viability, you have to look at the fundamental causes. And anti-Black racism is a fundamental cause. So in, in concert with all of the research, in concert with all of the system change, in concert with all of the clinical care that we have to do, we have to do something about anti-Black racism. Otherwise, things won't move forward. Now, clearly, I have a particular view here. And my view has been because I've been doing this for 33 years. I've been in this space. And 
Um, we've talked a lot about institutional or systemic racism. We talk about what it is, what it could be. We get knotted up in definitions. And I offer from Wellesley Institute a very simple definition of institutional racism. Seeing big differences in health between groups and not doing everything within your power to decrease it. It's very simple. If you see it and you say, eh, next year, yeah. or you say, if I get the money, or if you say, well, we've got other institutional priorities. Well, you know, it's clear what the outcome is going to be and you're part of the problem. And there is institutional racism. We've been on calls, we're on calls all of the time with people explaining why they can't do this. And I ask them, just explain to me how a rich country cannot produce equity for three and a half percent of its population. Now, how does that happen? I, you know, you, there must be money there. So viability is linked to institutional racism. You have to demonstrate feasibility, but viability is linked to institutional structural racism and anti-black racism. And so we have to do something about it. So last two slides. Uh, and I think this may be the last one because this is the old presentation, not the updated one. Is, um, no, it's two slides, I think. Is that we have to go back to this pathway and think of how we deal with the three bits of this pathway. What are we fundamentally going to do to decrease stress and social determinants of health? What are we going to do? What's the plan there? Yeah. How do we do that? What are we going to do to lift up it, um, uh, social environments and make sure that the social safety net is working properly. What's the plan there? And then what are we going to do on that clinical pathway and quality of clinical pair, care and equity in clinical care? What are we going to do? <laughs> and I think if we want things to happen, we make laws. That's what people listen to. It can't be a I'd like to. It has to be, actually, you have to do this. And so part of what I'm going to be dedicating myself to going forward is getting a law so that I don't have to have the conversation about, well, I'd like to, but. Yeah, I think you have to. And all public services and all public funding, and the first three bits are exactly the same as something called the Race Relations Amendment Act out of the UK. You've got to promote public, so you've got to promote equity, um, um, racial equity. So you've got to promote dismantling anti-black racism. It is your job as a public service to do this. It is your job, not just to offer equitable care, but to be able when somebody asks to prove it. You have to have the data. You have to have the information. You have to, and you have to make it transparent. You have to do it. Then my, the colleagues I know in the federal parliament will tell you they're all about equity, yeah? And actually worldwide, if you look at what they're doing, yeah, they are innovative in many ways. But I'm the guy, if you say to him, do you want um, a dessert or cheese? I say, no, I'll have both, thank you, okay? And I don't want uh, to just be very good. Well, I want actually this to work for black people. So I want the federal budget to be able to demonstrate what it's doing for equity for black people. Why can the federal government not demonstrate that it is uh, equitable for black people? It should be able to. We've seen those figures. I showed you the figures in the first half hour where I was depressing you, right? Uh, you've seen those figures. If anyone sees those figures and doesn't think we have to do something urgent and we have to be able to show that we are doing that, then I'm asking them, well, what are you for? What are you trying to do, right? 
I don't want to hear the good things, I want you to do it. But why isn't there a law that says it's not legal to have a COVID response where, where some parts of the population are 10 times more likely to die? How can that be legal? How can that be legal in a democracy? How can that be legal? And when you do new social policy, people say it's difficult to change the old. Well, you're making new policy all of the time. Make sure that policy has a race equality impact assessment. Make sure every new policy you have is oversized on its impact on the black population. Were you dropping something or clapping? You can do both. <laughs> You can drop and clap. And I want to see it. I want to see it monitored. I want to see it transparent. I want to see them have their mitigation strategy. If they're saying my strategy won't necessarily improve uh, black mental health, I say, well, what are you going to do instead? And how are you going to measure it? And how are you going to show me you're doing it? Because I don't actually want words. I'm getting too old. <laughs> I want to see the change and it's over time. And of course, we need a black mental health strategy. Yeah, it's complex. It's complex. I'm not the only person who's asking for it. Loads of people are asking for it. It is complex. Government isn't going to do this unless there is somewhere in government that does this. Yeah, if no one is in charge, no one is in charge, <laughs> right? Someone has to be in charge. Someone has to have a budget. Someone has to have a responsibility. Somebody has to produce the reports to parliament on what they're doing. Somebody has to be able to be audited by the auditor general and say, hey, you've got this money, why haven't you done something? That has to happen. That's how government works. And you have to have that. Otherwise it gets dispersed and nobody pulled the trigger. Yeah, it has to be somebody. What would it do? It would engage properly with black population. It's revolutionized the way we do mental health, not ivory tower down with uh, our people. It would produce models of the care, some of the things that are being done by the mental health and black Canadians, some of the things that's being done by Mary Drew, some of the things that's been done by people out there. Well, let's get it together. Yeah. Let's actually bottle it so that we can give it to other people. Yeah. Um, it has to produce interventions. It has to bring people in so that people in um, uh, uh, so that people in Nova Scotia can have the same access to being psychologists as people in Ottawa and in Toronto. Uh, that you know we can build skills, but not just in black population. Build skills in everybody who is going to see a black person. You need to be capable to see black people. Yeah, you need to be capable. How can it be that in somewhere like Ontario, 20, you know, with uh, a black population, that people can say, yeah, I don't know what to do. Really? Really? Uh, you qualified? Yeah. Who qualified you? What's your college doing about this? You know, they have to train you. You have to pass that. And that's why I love the fact that everyone coming through here is doing anti-black racism training. And it would hold government data and monitor progress and it would support the building of the research capacity. Last slide. People say this couldn't happen. People say this is impossible and governments don't think like that. I just want to reflect on you, with you, on the fact that during the pandemic, the Public Health Agency of Canada and uh, Theresa Tam produced a report. And their report talked about the um, pandemic equity model. It talked about innovations. Uh, we could talk about innovations in mental health. They were talking about innovations in public health. It talked about rapid innovations to make sure that things work properly for diverse populations. It talked about new action, just different, different ways of doing things. And then underneath that, it said, but we have to work on the um, uh, social determinants of health if we want this pandemic to work, otherwise it won't work. So government can do that in a pandemic, can think about it in a pandemic. Why can't we think fundamentally, take that pandemic learning, not just the scars of the pandemic, the pandemic learning, and move that into um, 
what we want to do with black health. There was a really funny end slide here, but it never made it. No, there was a last slide just saying, you know, everything that I have stated has some research backing it. Yeah. This is stuff that's known. I've just put it together. Some of it's mine, a lot of it isn't. This is possible. Yeah, this is possible, but it's made possible and facilitated by a push on having a law in place that makes it imperative, that makes it illegal to carry on the way we're going. Because unless we have that law, we may carry on. We'll, we'll be able to make a difference, but not as much difference if people have to do it rather than if they, we just have to wait for allies. And it's great to have allies here. Yeah. But not everybody's our ally. Other people have their own issues that they have to deal with. And uh, equality, equ equity and justice are things that you have to fight for. Yeah. But you should have the law on your side. So I am really happy to have had the chance to be here. It's uh, beautiful just seeing the faces. Uh, I'm happy uh, to take questions if there's time. And uh, I was supposed to uh, depart first thing tomorrow morning because of uh, my schedule's nasty, but I've managed to, I think I've managed to, sh to move it around. So I'm gonna be here tomorrow as well. Uh, so if you don't get a question now and you have a question you want later on, then uh, just, just bug me with that question. I won't necessarily be able to answer it, but I'll try from you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this. Tell, 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 tell me your name, right? Patricia. Patricia My name is Patricia. Right. Wow. And I thank you so much. I, I, there are no words. But I have a question. I, I live in Toronto. Ooh. And um, I'm a social worker, psychotherapist. And the most common thing that's crossing my path is the level of funding for psychotherapy. So everywhere has a wait list a mile long. Um, before the, the pandemic, the organization I worked with, we didn't have a wait list. Now we have six months to a year. Um, other agencies have wait lists. So my question <laughs> in your research, is there anything in there that will have the government focusing on psychotherapy? Yeah. Okay, Thank so you. in Ontario, um, the, the one of the things uh, as one of the things in Ontario is that uh, Ontario has put says it's going to put three point eight billion dollars into uh, mental health uh, over the next few years, and one of the major things it's supposed to do is expand access to psychotherapy. It has been doing this for two or three years. It hasn't done it very well. And I know that Ontario Health at the moment are trying to work out how to make it better. Now, we have been fighting with them for different reasons. Uh, we've developed, I don't know, have you, you've been tra trained in uh, culturally adapted CBT? But culturally adapted CBT. Okay, so we have developed a module uh, where we uh, culturally adapted CBT specifically for the black population, right? and there's training available. And we have been trying to uh, get that rolled out. So in uh, CHC, Women's Health in Women's Hands, they're doing culturally adapted CBT specifically for black women. And they're seeing four or 500 people a year, right? In Taibu, which is a CHC for um, uh, black uh, people in Malvern, they are starting uh, culturally adapted CBT which is being funded by the ministry. And we're trying to get more ministry money 
to put into uh, the uh, the Sapersea satellites, which are community mental health satellites for black people, so that they can offer culturally adapted CBT. But getting money out of the ministry can be difficult and can set, take some time. So it is, I am, I believe that there will be an expansion of access to um, CBT and other structured psychotherapies. But my worry is, unless we specifically have um, CBT for black populations, it will not get to black populations. And so that's the fight we're having in with the ministry, inside the ministry, to try to make Ontario Health make uh, access to uh, psychotherapy part of the Black Health Plan. And we will know by, I reckon, March, whether the money comes. So it, we're, we're on it. I can't say we'll 100% succeed, but we're on it. Yeah, but you're, you're right, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? Oh, service. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your presentation, yeah. um, my, my brother. Yeah, um, tell, tell, tell me your name so that. Uh, my name is Robin. Robin. I, hey. Hi. I run a group called the 613 819 Black Hub here. It's a black political advocacy group. I do it full time, paid by your federal tax dollars, my brother. Good. Um, I came here for one reason, and that was as an advocate to find out where I need to push. One of the things we had already decided on was that we were, we were going to push at the federal level for a black equity commissioner, similar to the ones the federal, federal government has announced on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. But now with the law, you've given me something to get for the black equity commissioner to push for. So thank you very much. You've helped me already achieve my goal. Oh, well, wow. that's the that's result. Thanks very much, Robert. I was waiting for you to ask me a question, but uh, it's good. That was better than a question. Any other questions down at the front here? Oh. Down at the front here. Oh, should, hang on. Do I I'm yeah. gonna go to her and then? Or... Oh, no. It, oh, sorry. Hey. <laughs> and then down at the front. So please, okay. you. Yeah, sorry. Hi. I didn't see. I, I, That's okay. Me. I'm short. Uh, my name is what? Odian, and I kind of have a two part question. Everyone who knows me is used to it, but I promise it's easy. Isn't a question, it's two questions. Kind of. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one, how can we access your slides? Because you said that they were available for all of us. Okay, so I sent the slides and I've sent an updated version of the slides. The updated version of the slides, how can they get them? Okay. So Ash Jude? Oh, send it to all registered people. Okay, Thank perfect. You. And then the next question is, um, Ontario is a lot more forward thinking than Alberta, which is where I am out of. So do you have any tips for us as we navigate our current um, premier to try and get this kind of systematic rules happening? Hmm. So uh, you've got Danielle Smith, right? Sorry? You've got Danielle Smith. Right? I'm going to say yes. I've blocked her out. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay. For those who don't know, she is very, well, she just voted against critical race theory as an example. So we're in an interesting place in Alberta right now when it comes to this kind of work. So sometimes, um, so Harper was in charge when the Mental Health Commission of Canada was brought into being. Reagan was in charge when uh, the Office of Health Equity uh, was created in the United States. And Rob, uh, Doug Ford was in charge of the city of Toronto when we managed to change the city laws so that anybody who lived in Toronto, you didn't have to be a citizen, you didn't have to be landed, you just had to live in Toronto. Anybody who lived in Toronto was, uh, had, equitable, was, uh, had access to all city services. Yeah, uh, it is possible to make change when you have a right-wing populist in charge. Uh, the question is, can you set up win-win-win situations 
that uh, manage to gain ground without you losing integrity, uh, but also manage uh, to help, not necessarily help their negative agenda, but help some other agendas. It's completely possible to do. It's just more difficult. And um, the question for me with people like Danielle Smith or Doug Ford or others who you know, are elected by the, by the population and uh, are in power because democracy, uh, is, that's the way democracy works, is what do they want? What do they need? And how can I move forward uh, the needs of uh, the desires of black people uh, inside what is the political reality at the time? Uh, Wellesley Institute is apolitical. We're not on anybody's side. We're only interested in health and we'll work with anybody. There are some people who are easier to work with than others, but you know, if the work needs to be done, the work needs to be done. And sometimes you can make amazing progress. We got race-based data collected during COVID with a conservative government. Yeah. We got that. We got the Black Health Plan with a conservative government. It's possible. It can be sometimes more difficult if governments have different priorities, but it's totally possible. And so uh, I've been doing this for 30 years and I did it as, you know, as a baby during Thatcher and um, in the UK and I you know, worked uh, in, in the States under, um, um, under Clinton. And um, you, know, you just have to work it. But don't give up. Uh, the biggest and the biggest tool of bureaucracy is inertia. They want you to get frustrated. Yeah, they want you to turn your back and say it's impossible. That, that's what they want. <laughs> that, that, if you just keep on going and you keep at it, yeah, and you look after yourself at the same time, yeah and you know that it's long-term, not short-term, you can make progress. Yeah. So, you know, but, but uh, so just, you know, yeah, I, I can see. And one of the big things that you have to think about is you've got Alberta health services, so you don't necessarily have to work at the political level, you can work at the bureaucratic level. Next question. Yeah, okay, yeah, five minutes, that's good. Questions may dry up now you've said five minutes, yeah, so it'd be okay, yeah. Thank you so much for that very wonderful, detailed, <laughs> walking us through the issues and what we can do. Um, I'm Josephine Etoa, I'm a full professor here in the Faculty of Health Sciences ah, and a research chair for Black Women's Health. I know who you are. Um, yeah. yeah, I remember. <laughs> Yeah. 13 years ago, you and I did the keynote for the Black Mental yeah. Health Conference yeah. in Calgary. Yeah, I remember. I like, yes. Oh, I know this woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a welcome home to Ottawa. So I have a comment and, Ooh, and okay. then a question. Uh, my comment is more around uh, actually the, the, uh, the proclamation of March 2nd as the Black Mental Health and Racism Day in Toronto. We did the same thing. Once we had the, the, what you were doing in Toronto, we mobilized in Ottawa, applied and got uh, Ottawa to also proclaim March 2nd as Black Canadian Mental Health Day. That was on March 2nd, 2020 as oh, well. Perfect. So I missed that because yes. of the pandemic. And, and from that group, we, we met and continued, and that work has continued to form the Coalition for Black Canadian Mental Health here in Ottawa. And so I'm hoping that you see we're learning from the work happening in Toronto and we're mobilizing in Ottawa. The Black leadership did the same thing you were doing in Toronto, just like the COVID-19 hit and you were mobilizing for data. We were doing the same thing, writing letter, letters to people until we start Ottawa Public Health Collected Data. Your result came out in, in the summer. Our results started coming out in the fall. By September, we were reporting on what's happening in the Black community and hotspot. So I'm hoping that even with the mental, uh, with the provincial platform you're talking about, that Ottawa will be right there working closely 
uh, with you on that agenda and how we can work together, as you said, you as should, a team. You should come to, we'll get you into the Black Health Plan <laughs> meetings. You can come and teach us what you're doing here. It's fabulous. Thank you. Um, so my question now, it's about your work, the AGAP. You talk about data, we're collecting data. So what's next? Uh, how do we govern that data? Okay. How do we protect that data? You did the work with the uh, Black Equity, Black Health Equity Group. What's next step for that work? I'm using it in my work, okay. that framework. So the framework uh, that um, you're talking about is something called the EGAP. It stands for Engagement, Governance, Access and Protections. And the fact was we could started collecting the data, but we said, we need a different way of governing this data. We need a community-based way of governing this data so that this data is not misused. So we produced this model called the EGAP. So what's happening with the EGAP is that um, the Toronto region for Ontario Health uh, is sponsoring a, um, uh, a piece of work where we are writing the implementation guide to the EGAP, which will be out next year. The Ontario Health Data Council, which is producing a report, which goes to the government of Ontario about how the new data environment should be looked at, uh, is also uh, has a submission saying the EGAP should be used. And ICES, the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences, have brought me onto the advisory board of ICES to try and help them with community-based governance. And the idea of community-based governance is basically nothing about us without us, uh, but the way we are selling it to government and others is if you want good quality data, you have to engage communities, otherwise people aren't giving you their data. And uh, so the EGAP is taking off. Uh, you will see more coming out. We've got Jamal Demke, who's just the most brilliant researcher uh, who's pulling this together for us. So, so. I don't know that, and, uh, and has anybody else got a microphone in their hand? One over here and one over here, and they're the last two questions. So make them good. They've all been good. Hi, yeah. good evening. Hi. My name's Joanne. I work for Joanne. Surrey Place in Toronto. Oh, you're in Hi. Surrey Place. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Um, okay. And one of the questions I have, is there any plans or talks happening uh, between partnering with any of the agencies um, in the developmental sector to, to see the intersectionality between disabilities and mental health, um, but as specific to a poster presentation we're doing on Friday, uh, Black mental health as it relates to the developmental sector. So I was just wondering if there was any plans in any of the, the work that's being done to partner with any, and what, and what? Yeah. Oh, and put it in the research, sorry, my colleague. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I understand, and the research. And the so research, That's yes. an interesting thing. I think that's a blind spot on uh, some of the plans that there have been. Uh, because uh, in Ontario, as you know, the Centre for Excellence is this group that's supposed to be uh, helping the government work out how to spend their money on mental health. And I don't think the Centre for Excellence is doing very much on the developmental sector. And then, of course, because people have to engage with the Centre of Excellence, everything gets distorted by that. So, I th so thank you for the question. I'll take that back because I think that's a big gap. Yeah, I think it's a, it, it is a big gap and I think we should be doing more. And if we swap emails, then you can keep me honest about that and I can make sure that we move, we, we move it forward and we get, we get that because that, that's a blind spot, yeah. Yeah, that's why I said you could have my email because I want you to hold me to that because uh, it's only perfect when we're working together, right? To, to try and get things through, um, you know, otherwise it doesn't work. Community is what we need, yeah. Hi there, my name is Alana Hi. and I am also from Toronto. Um, over the last- So I think... just a second, Toronto people only meet in Ottawa? <laughs> is, that, is that how it works? I'll make sure I connect after. Um, one of the things that I've been working with uh, through the University of Calgary, when COVID hit, we looked at the psychological trauma that frontline staff uh, were experiencing. 
and um, to uh, I, I guess to kind of zero it in, my interest was really looking at folks with lived experience. And I know that COVID-19, everybody is talking about frontline staff, but I think we should be acknowledging that the Black population, we're generally at the front line of doing this work. And so I haven't heard so far, the conference has just started, but I haven't heard where is the support for us as frontline staff. And I'm acknowledging that even with wearing a director's hat, but there certainly has to be support for us, right? Because we're on the front lines, police, um, ambulance, they are trained, they have supports, they are deemed as being the first responders, but we're on the ground before the police comes, before emergency services comes, we're de-escalating, right? We're making sure the guns and knives or whatever is held at bay, we're taking care of everybody else, making sure there's stability, right? And so where's the training for us? Where's the support? And I think I'd like to hear a little bit more about what's your commitment and how you could ensure that us that are driving the bus to take care of all these data collections <laughs> be represented and well supported. Thank you. Good, good point, good point, good point. So where, where do you work? Keep, keep, the, keep the microphone, sir. Where do you work? Sorry? You're at Fred Victor. So one of the, sorry? Okay, so one of the problems, and this is a problem, is that if you go to CAMH, uh, CAMH and everybody has set up services for the uh, trauma of uh, first responders and the health sector. Within CAMH, we've set up uh, healing circles and support for black CAMH staff. What has generally happened in the third sector, like Fred Victor uh, and others, is there is no support. Nothing nothing whatsoever. And the people who would produce a report, such as the United Ways and things like that, their staff are traumatized as well. Yeah. So there isn't the support there. So one of the things that I would hope that a Black Health Plan would be is to zero in on that support. We've talked about it. Yeah. We've talked about a submission that would try to produce much more support for the third sector, uh, specifically because of the trauma of COVID. We've talked about it. And so uh, have we done anything? No. Will we do something? Yes. Yeah. And what we will do with this is they're going to bug me about the um, developmental sector, but you and I and the people in Fred Victor uh, are going to, I'm going to set up a meeting between you and the United Way and others who will fund this. Yeah, and we will get it done. It's not even a lot of money. Yeah, we can, we can, you know, and, and I mean, we'll open the meeting to whomever, whoever wants to be there. It doesn't just have to be Fred Victor, but let's do it. Sorry? So, and it doesn't even, so if, if we want to do it, we can do it. Uh, I know how to get in front of funders, and I think it's imperative. And I can tell you one of the reasons why they will do it, because every one of those people, all the United Way organizations, YMCAs and things like that, they're having problems getting and retraining staff. Yeah, all of them. I sit on the national board of the YMCA. I can see what's happening. I used to sit on the board of the United, uh, sorry, of the YMCA. I used to sit on the board of the United Way. I can see what's happening. And so I think a very straightforward, me speaking to people at CAMH, people in the community who may offer that support and going to them with you and saying, let's do this. Yeah, that could happen. Good, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, we, you know. So, but you, you know, literally, let's, I, I think this is incredibly important and I'm completely, completely happy uh, to sit with you and get it done and we'll put, we'll put our muscle behind it. It's important. So thank you for that. So. so can we get another round of applause for Dr. Kwame McKenzie?
Again, we thank you so much, doctor, for coming out and being the keynote speaker for today. If you know that this was powerful, imagine what's going to be coming along the way. And he spoke about something that's extremely, extremely important for us to remember. Yes, we can take an interventive approach, but we also need to start taking a proactive and preventative approach. And that requires us to tackle systems. It doesn't just mean that we're tackling the healthcare. We need to tackle the systems that have caused these healthcare problems in the first place. But with that being said, we've come to the end of our conference. I know you had to see my ugly mug and this beautiful face all night. <laughs> but we really do want to thank you for being with us and for joining us in this conversation. You know, as I said before, <laughs> As I said before, this has been a transformative evening, and I can only imagine what the rest of these conversations are going to be like as we continue on with the conference in the next few days to come. Parfait. Euh, ce n'est pas parce que la période de questions est terminée que euh, ça veut dire que la conversation a pris fin. Donc, pour tous ceux et celles qui auraient des questions supplémentaires ou des commentaires ou aimeraient discuter avec euh, le docteur Kwame ou, euh, ou euh, l'un des invités, vous pouvez nous rejoindre au cocktail qui, euh, qui aura lieu tout de suite après euh, le, le, le chant de clôture. So, before we get into the closing song, there's a couple announcements we want to be able to make. One of the first announcements is that if you were if you were given a translation device, a uh, interpretation device, please return them at the when you guys are leaving. Please return it as they need to be used for the rest of the conference. So we can't have anybody just taking them away. Uh, so that is one announcement, and we have another announcement. We just kind of want to give thanks to all the people that have been participating throughout this evening, including our beautiful instrumentation today, uh, Luca Ministries, uh, CBR, which is the first time I've ever heard him called Cibel R. That's beautiful. <laughs> and Lika Ness, thank you so much for being part of tonight and giving us that beautiful, amazing live instrumentation. Mm -hmm. Nous aimerions également remercier toutes les personnes qui ont travaillé en arrière-plan pour faire de cette soirée un tel succès. Nous citons euh, l'équipe euh, l'équipe technique audiovisuelle, les huissiers, les serveurs, les bénévoles et surtout les responsables et organisateurs du programme. And that includes Wina, who's been kind of running things in the back, not, not trying to be seen, but doing a whole lot. <laughs> Please, I mean, stand up for these folks. They've been doing a lot of work in the background. They deserve just as much a round of applause as the rest of us. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please join us again tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. as we continue the conversation in the rest of the conference. Um, if you know that this was a powerful conversation, just know we're adding on to it and we want to inspire not only change for ourselves, but for communities for a long time to come. Join us over on the other side with the cocktails. Good night, everybody. Without further ado, Vision Choir singing our closing song, Precious Lord. <laughs>